Hi, uh, welcome to our talk. Uh, today, Heiko Lorke and I uh, are going to present our paper with the title, No Place to Hide, Contactless Probing of Secret Data on FPGAs. Let's uh, start the talk uh, with the security of SRAM-based FPGAs. Uh, well, SRAM-based FPGAs are really popular for different applications and they are used nowadays in critical applications. Um, but there is a disadvantage of these kind of devices. And the disadvantage is that these devices contain volatile memory, so the configuration actually should be stored in an external non-volatile memory. So, and it raises actually some security issues. Uh, let's first talk about, the, discuss how this configuration works. In the first phase, the designer actually designed the application, right? And so in the trusted field, in a trusted field, the designer stored this configuration into an NVM. And this configuration is called actually beta stream. So later in the adversarial field or in an untrusted field, the configuration of the FPGA or the beta stream should be loaded from the NVM to the FPGA to configure the device. So if the communication is not secured, the eavesdropper or some, the attacker can actually eavesdrop the communication between NVM and the FPGA to just you know, clone the design, clone the beta stream. She might be able to reverse engineer the, the design based on the configuration. She might be able also to just launch some spoofing attack or just do some tampering attack and change the design. So there is a conventional countermeasure for this uh, treat. Um, so the, this contain actually um, the beta stream encryption. In this case, in the trusted field, the designer load a secret red key to the FPGA. This secret red key will be stored in a non-volatile, uh, in a sorry, battery baked RAMs or if users of the FPGA. In the second phase, the designer actually uh, encrypt the design or the beta stream with the red key and AES algorithm. And he has stored the design actually into an NVM. Later in the untrusted field, this encrypted beta stream will be loaded to the PGA. On the PGA, we have AES decryptor, and then it decrypts the design. And finally, the device will be configured. So it seems actually to be secure, but it has been shown that uh, this kind of configuration can be broken. It has been shown that, for example, uh, using DPA, differential power analysis, you can actually uh, extract the key during decryption of the beta stream. And the solution from different FPGA vendors was, okay, let's first authenticate um, the beta stream so then the attacker cannot really choose random chosen ciphertext to, to apply to launch DPA. But recently, we, have, we can see that the beta stream itself is itself large enough that the attacker actually can partition the, the beta stream into different parts and again, just uh, launch the DPA. So key rolling has been introduced in order to update the key after some few bytes of data in the beta stream. And finally, uh, FPGA vendors started to integrate DPA resistant uh, AES cores or decryption actually cores into their FPGAs in type of ASICs, hard, hard cores, or they give the possibility to the customer to go and buy a DPA resistant AES decryptor core, for example, from a third party developer. But there is a treat also from another type of attacker, which is a semi-invasive attacker. So for example, it's, it is known that if you have a, a scanning electron microscope, you can actually read out the content of the if users. So if the secret rate key is stored on the if users on the FPGA, you're able to extract those keys. So the solution, which is recently introduced to many FPGAs, is physically unclonable functions. Again, you can find those puffs in ASICs in, in, in many FPGAs in, or in next models of FPGAs which they come to the market. Or you have still the possibility to go and buy a soft IP core for the path from a third party developer and integrate it to your device. And for those who are not familiar with the path, path is just a, it creates random keys or generates a random response 
based on the manufacturing variation on the device. And it can also be used for fingerprinting of your device. However, we still don't see any protection for the semi-invasive attacks or fully invasive attacks from the IC backside, for the FPGA backside, more precisely. So, but before talking about the last, the final uh, um, point, let's discuss how these countermeasures work in reality. So, so this solution is, this countermeasure, for example, provided by Xilinx, but different FPGA vendors might have different approaches, but at the end, um, they are more or less the same. So in this case, in the trusted field, the designer actually loads the, the puff configuration into the FPGA, and then send the secret red key over JTAG to the FPGA, right? So the puff will be configured on the device, it generates its responses, or we call it here puff key. The puff key is actually used to wrap the secret red key to, and generate a black key. So red actually in our talk meant that the key itself is not encrypted, is in plain text, and now we have a black key which is an encrypted key actually on the device. So now the designer has two possibilities. Either he can just store this black key on the device or he sends the black key and the puff configuration to the NVM. In the second phase, still we are in the trusted field, uh, the secret red key will be used to encrypt the design. So, and the encrypted beta stream is also stored on the NVM. Finally, the designer maybe wanted to have also a DPA resistant uh, IP core, which is updatable. He also loaded to the NVM. Now in the untrusted field, we need two phases of bootloading. In the first stage bootloading, the path will be configured on the device, the black key will be loaded to the device, and the D AES decryptor core, decryptor core is also configured on the device. So path generates its responses, it unwraps the black key to generate the red key, and of course the encrypted beta screen in the second phase of bootloading will be loaded to the device and will be decrypted uh, with the red key. So, uh, here as you see, the secret red key is generated instantly on the device, so it's a volatile, it, it's a volatile key actually, and it is undie only signal only, so it is, there is no way to actually read it out from the FPGA, so from the outside board. The second thing is that the puff, although we have seen a lot of puff attacks in the literature, so the puff here, is actually somewhat a controlled puff. So you don't have really access directly to the challenges of the puff. The responses of the puff are also just generated instantly on the device. You, the attacker has not any access to the responses of the puff, right? So it, it's a controlled puff and the traditional attacks on puffs, they, are, they don't really work. And finally, in order to raise the security, the designer can just uh, remove the black key and the puff from the FPGA in order to uh, just don't leave any traces from those uh, keys. You know? Okay, so um, as Shine said, um, this red key is on the device, it's volatile, it's uh, on die only, and we wanted to see if we can actually get to that key um, and the method that we wanted uh, what, that we propose in our paper is a method that is established in failure analysis, which is called optical contactless probing. And this shows a basic setup for optical contactless probing, a simplified version. So what you do is you have a laser. Um, it illuminates the device through the backside, hits the transistor, some part gets reflected, and then it enters a detector. And what happens is if you apply different voltages here to this part, this will actually change the refractive index and the absorption coefficient, which means that the light that is incident on this detector, the intensity of this light will actually change. You can, very, in basic, very basic terms, think of this as transistor on, much light, transistor off, fewer light. Um, signal is rather small, so you have to average it, but um, what you then get is basically an oscilloscope which has a laser for a test lead. So you can just point your laser spot anywhere on the device 
Um, usually this is infrared light, so you can just go through the device backside. And this technique is then called laser voltage probing. And in this case, um, you can just get the waveform of any transistor that you point the laser at. Um, the interesting question for this is you have to know where the transistor actually is. And for this, failure analysis uh, has also developed a technique to find nodes of interest, which is called laser voltage imaging. And in this case, you use this signal from the detector, but instead of averaging it to get a waveform trace, you put it into a very narrow frequency filter. And if you set that filter to a certain frequency, for example, in failure analysis, to the clock frequency, um, and then if you scan the laser beam across the device, actually only when you hit a node that carries that frequency or that frequency component, you will get a signal out of the filter. And then if you map that, for example, if you use a clock frequency in that image that you will get from the laser voltage imaging experiment, will show you all the clock buffers, for example. So um, as I said, this has been used in failure analysis for quite a while. Um, this poses some restrictions to you because you don't really uh, you have to think in the frequency domain, um, but we will later see um, how we can use that for uh, our attack. Um, but you have to keep in mind that it's enough if you have a frequency component that can pass the filter. It doesn't have to be like a pure sine wave. So first I'll just give you a brief um, explanation of our setup. We use the Altera Cyclone 4 FPGA, which is 16 nanometer technology. Laser wavelength is 1.3 micrometer, and we use the proof of concept uh, key calculation, which is just a simple XOR of the black key and the puff key, and we use the ring oscillator, um, and for an optical setup, we used a common failure analysis microscope, which is called Hamamatsu FEMOS 1000. And for the first experiment, um, we considered a parallel implementation of the secret red key calculation. So you just take all the, you have the registers with the black key, you have the registers which contain your puff response, and then you uh, do an XOR in parallel on these. And then they get put into the red key registers and you want to get these. So as I said, you probably have to think in the frequency domain to actually see something in your laser voltage imaging map. And we had uh, the idea of the, the most simple approach to this is to actually induce a frequency. And we thought about this and we uh, used the most simple example, which is a reset loop. So you put the device in a reset loop. This is a reset signal. And then there are just two cases for the registers. It can, the registers in the red key can either receive a one or a zero. If they receive a one, then um, there will be some time, for example, register A receives a one. There will be some time that's passing for the calculation, then it will go to one. Then reset is asserted, so it will go low. Then reset is released, calculation will start again, and then this will just repeat. What you can see from this um, is that the fundamental frequency of this signal, of this waveform, is the same as the reset frequency. So if you set your filter to the reset uh, loop frequency, you will actually see this register in your laser voltage imaging map. Um, the register which receives a zero, on the other hand, there's no activity there, so, so you shouldn't see it on the laser voltage imaging map. So what you would expect uh, in very basic terms is like registers carrying a one to be white, registers carrying a zero to be black, and you get a map for the whole device. Um, so I'm gonna show you the results for this implementation uh, with laser voltage imaging now. Um, this is, uh, these are enlarged laser voltage imaging results, so usually you scan the whole device, but this is just for uh, the register blocks. We used 8-bit keys for our proof of concept, and you can nicely see, okay, there's some activity here, there's none here, there's some here, there, and um, you can just directly read the bits from this map. You see this is a one, this is a zero, and so on. Um, there are some funny shapes here, um, which are because of the way that the transistors are organized in the uh, logic elements inside the FPGA. But as you can see, um, you actually get all the keys and this is what you are aiming for. This is a red key. What you also see is that the XOR works, which is also nice because the FPGA is actually doing an XOR, which means we didn't mess up the coding. And um, 
For the next case, we consider a, a different implementation. This time we used the serial implementation, so we connected all these registers and then we shifted these bits through a XOR and then shifted them into the red key registers. In this case, you can't do such a simple black-white distinction because depending on the position of these registers in the, um, in the shift register for the red key, they have different levels of activity. So you can't say, okay, uh, black means one and uh, black means zero and white means one. But if you can somehow find this register, the whole key will get shifted through it and then if you can probe this with laser voltage probing, you will get the waveform that gets put through that register and as the whole key has to go through this register, you will then also see the key directly. And what you also have to keep in mind, because the device is still in a reset loop, um, the fundamental frequency of all these registers is still the reset frequency, but they might have a different amount of first harmonic component which will show up in your laser voltage imaging map. So we did this uh, experiment. So we first did laser voltage imaging to find the registers and then we went on to probe them. So you can see the laser voltage imaging map over here. Uh, you can see there's a familiar shape of the registers and you can see that there's actually some brightness differences and if you do a fast Fourier transform of the signals that you would expect uh, for the registers, you can see that the ones which get more bit shifts, which are potentially more interesting, have a higher first harmonic component. So in this case, you should probably try to probe the brightest registers first, which are the ones at the bottom. And actually, we, in the end, we used uh, these spots over here, not the uh, core register area. And you can see that actually this register is the shift in register, so all the key gets shifted through this, and you can read the key from this. And these are registers which are further down the shift register, so they just contain parts of the key. We have seen that uh, how we can extract or how we can directly probe the, the keys on the, on the PGA, but the attacker is still might, uh, is, might be interested to characterize the path itself. So um, in this case, we have implemented the ring oscillator path, and in order to characterize this kind of path, of course, you need to uh, measure, measure precisely the frequency of the individual ring oscillators. So, and then if the attacker has approximate frequency of the ring oscillators, she might be able to do laser voltage imaging to find the ring oscillators on the chip and then go to them and then measure precisely their frequencies. But how the attacker can get actually the uh, estimated frequency. So what we have done, we just connected the power line of the FPGA to the spectrum analyzer and then we searched in the frequency space and then we have found energy in some frequencies in, uh, in for example, I guess it was one me 100 megahertz. Then we could, f we could found the frequency of the ring oscillators but because the frequencies were really close together so the attacker cannot actually differentiate between the frequencies on the, on the power analysis. Uh, so therefore, just the, what she need to do is just should set the frequency filter, just run the laser voltage imaging. When you find uh, the ring oscillators, you can play with the parameters to find other ring oscillators a little bit different with different frequencies. And then you can run, you can launch laser voltage probing to precisely measure the frequency of each individual ring oscillator. So let's conclude the talk. The first lessons that we have learned uh, was that, okay, just replacing the battery baked RAMs or E fuses with physically uncontrollable functions doesn't really increase the security, uh, as somebody might first think, because if the, our attacker is a sophisticated attacker, so Puff also cannot prevent him or her to conduct such attack. Um, the puff can be, be controlled puff. Actually, we didn't care that the puff, how the puff is implemented at the first place because we could probe directly the keys and if the puff is, for example, a ring oscillator puff, we can also characterize it uh, in more details. The other interesting thing was that for this kind of experiments, actually we need, uh, we required just uh, minutes and hours. So, and this is much less time that if you want to conduct such attack with the FIP, and it's also might be more expensive to, to, uh, to launch it with the FIP. 
And finally, uh, we think that, we strongly believe that if no proper countermeasure or protection for the FPGA backside is going to be implemented, the future generation of FPGAs uh, will remain vulnerable to this kind of attack. Thank you.